Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Laura Lubbers and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy, or CURE. Today's webinar is entitled Rescue Medication Delivery Methods and Future Therapies, and it will be presented by Dr. Nathan Fountain. This is a second installment of a two-part webinar series that describes seizure emergencies, reviews available rescue medications, and describes those in development. Today's webinar is being sponsored by our friends at the Band Foundation. CURE's mission is to find a cure for epilepsy by promoting and funding patient-focused research. CURE's robust grants portfolio has advanced epilepsy research across areas such as infantile spasms, post-traumatic epilepsy, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, or SUDEP, and epilepsy genetics. Dr. Fountain, who is our speaker today, is the Thomas Worrell Professor of Neurology and Epileptology at the University of Virginia, where he is the director of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Program. He's the president of the National Association of Epilepsy Centers and the chair of the FDA Advisory Committee for Nervous System Drugs. He also performs clinical research to test potential new drugs and devices to treat epilepsy. Before Dr. Fountain begins, I wanna encourage everyone to ask questions. You may submit your questions anytime during the presentation by typing them into the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your Zoom panel and clicking send. My colleague from CURE, Brandon Laughlin, will read them aloud during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We do want this webinar to be as interactive and as informative as possible, but to respect everyone's privacy, we ask that you make your questions general and not specific to a loved one's epilepsy. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Fountain. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to speak today. I hope we're able to cover a lot of things that uh, it, everyone finds useful. It's a really exciting new time to talk about rescue therapies and uh, what I might call abortive therapies. The topic today is very timely. Let's see if I can advance the slides, there we go. And before I begin, though, I want to talk about why it's timely, because there's so much research going on, and talk about my disclosures. I do a lot of clinical research, as we mentioned, including in uh, sponsored by these companies listed here, some of whom have developed rescue therapies, particularly Norellis, uh, Engage, and UCB. I'm going to talk about the off-label use of many medications. That means the use of these medications for things that are not approved by the FDA. Physicians often prescribe medications, particularly in the epilepsy space, for things that are not particularly indicated. And I'll try to talk about that, but I want you to be aware of that. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about medications that are in development, which are not available now. Uh, and of course, since they're not available now, are not FDA approved. I also wanna really em emphasize before we begin that all these treatments can cause serious side effects or problems. So all aspects should be discussed with your physician. Of course, seizure emergencies are seizure emergencies by definition, and so we use uh, strong or powerful medications to treat it. And consequently, the medicines themselves can have problems, so it's really important to discuss all of that with your physician. So moving to what we're actually going to discuss, we're gonna talk about what are seizure emergencies, you know exactly what we're talking about, and that's more complicated than it might seem. We're gonna talk about when are rescue medications used, what is the history of rescue therapies? Because right now we're in a big transition from sort of a, a long historical lag to what probably is about to be an explosion in rescue therapies. Who should have rescue therapies, uh, which has kind of a short answer, and what rescue medications are available now? And that's really what we'll spend most of the time talking about because it's probably what you want to know most. If you or your loved one has epilepsy, you wanna know what's available now. But also we want to talk about what rescue medications are in development because that's also important because some of those will be available soon. So what is a seizure emergency? Well, to talk about that, we have to back up a little bit and provide some definitions. So we know exactly what we're talking about. So what is a seizure? Well, a seizure is an event of altered movement or behavior or thinking. In other words, someone does something that's due to sudden discharges of, of nerve cells or neurons in the brain. So that means the brain's ticking along normally, has its electrical storm that goes on for a while and causes the seizure and then stops. Epilepsy, on the other hand, is the actual underlying condition that gives the tendency to seizures or the tendency to spontaneous recurrent seizures. In other words, seizures that come out of the blue, although they might be provoked by something, uh, so it's the underlying condition. 
So those are things that are kind of in the background. So now let's talk about clusters. Almost everyone with epilepsy who has had even more than a few seizures will think about their seizures in terms of clusters. And a cluster is just an increase in seizure frequency. And for your cluster, you have a clear definition in your mind. Well, of course, I had more than usual. And so for me, if I have one seizure a month and I had one a day for three days, that's a cluster of them. On the other hand, if I have seizures every day and one day I have 20 of them, that's a cluster of them. But those are really different things because one seizure once a day for three days is a discrete event from which you fully recover, for instance. Whereas if you have many in one day, you might not recover between them or you might have a different urgency in treating them. So clusters has an individual meaning that's clear to each individual, but it's not clear in general. Another term for is acute repetitive seizures. And that's the term that uh, historically the FDA has used, or at least has been used in FDA applications for drugs we'll talk about like rectal diazepam or diastat. And this is an increase in the number of seizures typically within one day and usually over the course of minutes or hours. So it's acute repetitive seizures. That's to be distinguished from a prolonged seizure, which is a single seizure that lasts more than five minutes but less than 30 minutes. We'll talk about why that is shortly. So a prolonged seizure, one long seizure, is to be distinguished from a number of brief seizures that occur over a short period of time, and that's to be distinguished from a number of seizures that happen over, say, days, even though that might be many more seizures than you'd normally have. And finally, there's status epilepticus. And status epilepticus is one long seizure that lasts more than 30 minutes, or a number of seizures over the course of 30 minutes, which you don't wake up in between, and so might have ongoing brain seizure activity, even if you're not having, say, jerking or other behavioral manifestations of the seizure. And the reason we distinguish status epilepticus from just a prolonged seizure is because if a seizure goes on for more than about 30 minutes, it's unlikely to stop spontaneously. So it requires intervention. It also can cause lots of other problems, not surprisingly. You know, one long seizure can uh, lead to even death. So we distinguish status epilepticus from a prolonged seizure from a brief seizure, which we just kind of arbitrarily call five minutes. And although I say arbitrarily, that's not quite right because most seizures stop within five minutes. And if they don't, and they go on to 30 minutes, there's some reasonable chance they'll go on even longer than that. So as we think about seizure emergencies here, we have to think about the time frame over which they occur because they have different kinds of urgency and therefore you can imagine re would require different kinds of treatment. So that means when a rescue medication is used is a next logical question. These are also called abortive therapies, which I personally prefer to rescue medicines because I think of rescue as someone hanging over the precipice and you're gonna go bring them back to the precipice and then treat whatever's wrong with them. Whereas abortive therapies means you're gonna stop the seizure no matter what, even if you don't save them in any other way. But, so it's entirely arbitrary. I personally prefer abortive, and, but in generally it's, they're called rescue medications now. One good thing about calling rescue medications, it does convey the urgency that generally uh, is required. And this refers to use of medicines at home, or at least not in the hospital, by patients themselves or by caregivers, so non-medically trained personnel. Uh, and it has several uses. Now that we've talked about the kinds of seizures, we can talk about the kind of uses. So first of all, it's to stop an ongoing prolonged seizure or to prevent the next seizure. So you have one seizure, when you have a cluster of seizures or even one seizure, you know you're going to have more, so you wanna stop the next seizure, so that's important. Or to stop the current seizure from progressing. And this is something we don't talk about much, but can happen. So some people who have seizures have a very small seizure, an aura, let's say, or have just a few jerks that ultimately can culminate in a big convulsive seizure or some, some bigger seizure. So by taking an abortive medicine or rescue medication, it might stop the seizure from progressing. So these are three different kinds of situations that we have to consider when you think about this. And that requires thinking a little bit about the history of the therapies because historically we only thought about prolonged seizures. We didn't really divide this up much into those other categories. And so it's important to recognize that as we talk about uh, how we thought about it. So if we go back to before the year 2000, uh, the advice was given was to call the rescue squad and even in the rescue squad, there's pretty limited intravenous IV therapies that the EMS, the emergency medical services would give. So for instance, when I was a medical student or early in training, I had one mentor who said to me, the first thing to do if somebody's having a seizure is go get a cup of coffee because most seizures stop on their own. And that's what he meant by that. But it was also true, we didn't have much, we go back 30 years, we didn't really have much to 
uh, to stop a seizure with. And so that was kind of the underlying philosophy. And the other underlying philosophy all those years ago before 2000 was really that seizures were unlikely to do harm unless they were very prolonged. So you got to think of that in the background as you think about where we're at today. We did have some off-label use of IV forms of diazepam, for instance, which could be injected rectally. So if we go back to even the late 1980s, there were a few neurologists who were specialists in epilepsy that would prescribe the IV form, the intravenous form of diazepam that comes in a bottle that could be pulled into a syringe and injected into the rectum through the, from the syringe without a needle. And that had lots of issues with it. You can imagine the main issue is you can't just go to the pharmacy, your regular outpatient pharmacy, and order up IV medication, particularly not back then. And there's really limited prescriptions even for oral pill forms of these medicines that we use now, like diazepam, lorazepam, and clonazepam. So for example, until uh, before 2000, it was pretty rare to give someone a prescription to say, take this pill. If you have one, if you have any, if you have two seizures in one day, take this pill to prevent the additional seizures in that day. That didn't happen very often. So now if we go ahead to the next era, which is between about 2000, 2010, rectal diazepam was approved. And the brand name of that is Diastat. And that was approved in 1997. And at that time, there was kind of a limited but growing use of oral pill, pill forms because with the approval of Diastat, it became recognized that really we should be treating these kinds of seizure emergencies as an outpatient. There's also increasing recognition that that was safe because the concern all along is that it would be unsafe, that these medicines would call, cause people to stop breathing or for their blood pressure to go too low. Then if we move ahead to the 2010s to, to now, to, to, uh, now to today, we really see an increasing oral pill form and rectal diazepam use. So it's much more common now than ever before. And we also see a lot more now off-label use of other IV forms of midazolam. So in the past 10 years, midazolam has become more popular. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And that's because it can be given intramuscularly into a muscle, which if you're familiar is a relatively simple thing to do. Now I recognize people who are not medically trained, that seems uh, intimidating but it's relatively simple for anyone with even a little bit of medical training. And we also have increasing use of intranasal, so up the nose forms of medications, which uh, were pretty uncommon until the past 10 years, even in a medical setting. Now in a medical setting, for instance, anesthesiologists uh, often use intranasal delivery of drugs for children, who of course don't wanna get an IV just like everybody else, but especially more than everybody else. And that has spread also outside of the hospital to use at home as an off-label use of this. Now, uh, we have to talk about what rescue medications are approved for use to start with. In other words, where are we starting from today? What's available today before we talk about what will be available in the future? And the med kinds of medications we use are benzodiazepines. And benzodiazepines are a whole class of medications that are commonly used in medicine, have been around for a long time, uh, and are familiar to physicians and to a lot of people at home too, of course. Diazepam is the generic name, so the chemical name for drugs you might be familiar with like Valium or Diastat is the rectal form of Diazepam. Lorazepam is a different benzodiazepine and that's the generic or chemical name for Ativan, to which you might be familiar. So it's often called Ativan instead of Lorazepam. And Clonazepam, whose brand name is Clonopin. And clonazepam is somewhat commonly used for the regular outpatient treatment of epilepsy, unlike the others. So something that's sometimes prescribed for everyday use to prevent seizures, unlike these others that we're talking about that are taken just when you have a cluster of seizures or acute repetitive seizures or a prolonged seizure. And then midazolam or Versed. And midazolam uh, until now has really had no outpatient uses. It's something that is used in the hospital under tight control because it's relatively powerful. And what's meant by powerful, which isn't really a medical term, of course, is that it's potent. And that means a little bit of it goes a long way. So in the hospital, we're very careful about how we give the intravenous or IV form of midazolam. So if you get too much, it'll put someone right to sleep and could even suppress their respirations. Uh, so we're very careful to use it. And so it has that history or background. But in relatively small doses, it's safe, as we'll talk about. And then alprazolam, which is commonly known as Xanax. And so for most people with epilepsy, they're probably cocking their head and saying Xanax for epilepsy. And it's true that we've not used alprazolam or Xanax commonly for as a rescue or abortive therapy for seizures. There's a number of reasons for that. One is it's very short acting, but also we're just not familiar. So that has not been popular, but the reason I'm talking about it is because 
the uh, a different form, an inhaled form, is in development for uh, as a rescue therapy. The common thing that all of these drugs do is inhibit brain nerve cells from firing. So they work on the GABA system, the GABA system, and the GABA system is what inhibits your neurons, keeps them from firing. So you can imagine if the seizure is too much firing in neurons, and if you shut that down, it'll stop the seizure. And that's pretty fundamentally the way it works. In medium doses, these can, these can be sedatives. So as I mentioned for midazolam, that you might know as Versed, we use it in the emergency room or in the hospital as a mild sedative, that is when someone needs a little bit of anesthesia. But in high doses, all of these can slow or stop breathing. They make people unconscious, so you, you can use them as anesthesia in high doses. But the re reason that's a risk or what the concern is, is that it can stop someone's breathing. The IV forms are very effective at stopping ongoing seizures in the emergency room. And in the emergency room, it's a tight controlled situation. So if someone stops breathing, we have all kinds of mechanisms to take care of it. And so although the outpatient home treatment of uh, seizure clusters or acute repetitive seizures is something new to think about, as an inpatient emergency room, it's established care. It happens every day and we don't give it a second thought. So these medicines are used in the ER every day without any concern because there's just, everyone's familiar and have established protocols or ways of doing that. The formulation for rescue medications is really important and that means the way in which it's made up. Uh, because remember, you could take a pill, everybody's familiar with that. You could use it as an IV form that goes in a vein, you're familiar with that. We talked about the intramuscular form in which is injected into a muscle. So think about it going into a big thigh muscle, for instance, or a shoulder muscle, like when you get a vaccine sometimes you might think about as an intramuscular form. But there's other places you're less familiar. It can go into the rectum. So that's rectal medication that goes into the bottom and that's absorbed uh, somewhat easily, not surprisingly when you think about that soft mucosal lining, meaning the lining of the rectum. And then it can go up the nose. So that's intranasal. And we can think about that with things like Afrin. When you have a bottle, you squirt up your nose and then it gets atomized. It gets turned into a very fine mist that deposits itself uh, in the nasal epithelium. That's the lining of the nose and is absorbed easily that way. So the formulations that are available <clears throat> are really important. And they're listed here on the slide for each one of the drugs. Diazepam, that is Valium, the thing that most people are familiar with, comes in a pill form, of course, and that's what usually you're thinking about. It can also be given rectally as a gel, and that uh, we'll talk a bit about, or it can be given IV. Whereas lorazepam is only available in the pill form or the IV form. It's not available in gel. It's not intended to be dissolved under the tongue, but that is possible to do. So some people put a lorazepam pill under the tongue. And it can be absorbed. There's a number of problems with that. The most practical, simple problem is that uh, it's probably not going to stay under the tongue. And some forms, particularly generic form, doesn't dissolve very well. And so it's not, it's probably most often just gets dissolved in the saliva and swallowed. But, some, but there may be some increased absorption to put under the tongue. Clonazepam also comes in pill form. And that's the only form it comes in in the United States. Uh, it can be available as a wafer you can put under your tongue. That's a little bit difficult to get, but it's available. So most people just use a regular clonazepam pill. Uh, the wafer historically has only been available in brand name. That's a little uh, expensive and complicated. Midazolam or Versed in the popular uh, brand comes in an IV form, an intramuscular form that we've used for a long time. That same IV form can be given intranasally. So it's possible to simply get a bottle of the IV medication to draw it up in a syringe, to put an atomizer, a little thing that turns into a mist and blow it up the nose. As a matter of fact, you can do that with any medicine that's mixed in water or something like water. The problem is sort of two or three fold. So the first problem is it's a pretty big volume. So you have to blow a lot up the nose, like a whole milliliter, which you can think of as uh, sort of a fifth of a, uh, a tablespoon or a teaspoon. So it's a pretty big volume to put up your nose. It's not a very big, big volume to swallow. You can swallow a milliliter easily, but when you're blowing up your nose, it's kind of a lot of it. The second problem is that when it's atomized, you want these little atomizers that you force through, it's not necessarily atomized, so not all of it goes up. And so some just get squirted. And if it gets squirted at the back of the nose, it'll just be swallowed. And the third problem is you have to know that even if it gets deposited on the nasal epithelium, that is the nasal mucosa, the lining of the nose, 
in the passage is, it's actually going to be absorbed. So it's a little more complicated than just squirting something up the nose, and that's why it's taken so long to develop the intranasal forms. And it's also uh, a little difficult for pharmacies because a lot of them don't like to distribute medications that are intravenous and tend to be intravenous uh, to people for home use. But nevertheless, it's increasingly popular. I've certainly prescribed it many times. So who should have rescue therapies? Well, anyone that needs to stop an ongoing prolonged seizure. Uh, the, the important thing about this is that the person's not aware you have to avoid oral medications, that is medicines given by mouth. And there's two reasons. The main reason is because you don't want to choke on the pill. And if they have ongoing seizures, you're probably not going to be able to get it in their mouth in a way they can swallow anyway, particularly if it's a big convulsive seizure. So you have to think of other ways to give the medication. Uh, you also want a medication that's going to act quickly because, of course, you want to stop that ongoing seizure quickly. If the medicine doesn't kick in for half an hour, then they're going to be seizing for half an hour before it works. You want something that works quickly. So that's important for ongoing seizure treatment. Then if you think about you also may want to take it to prevent the next seizure. And that means you know you're going to have a cluster and you're going to prevent the next one a cluster. So I gave two examples earlier. One, I said one person has a cluster one seizure a day for three days. Let's say it's a woman around her menstrual period. So she knows if she has one today, she can have one tomorrow. Well, in that circumstance, you could simply take a pill that doesn't kick in for a long time, as long as it works for a whole day, for instance. On the other hand, for someone who has seizures, let's say once a day, but occasionally when they have two seizures, they know they're almost always gonna go on to have 10 seizures, and therefore they wanna prevent the next seizure in the next few minutes. Then you need a medication that can kick in very rapidly. You also might need a medication that's not oral because maybe you need to give it right after that, that first or second seizure before the person's awake. So that has important uh, implications for the kind of medicine or form of the medicine that you're going to give. Because if they're awake and swallowing, then you can give the oral medication, but if, and it, or if it's a long time, you can use a pill, but in most circumstances, you'd like to use some other formulation. And finally, to stop the current seizure from becoming more severe. So imagine someone has auras, which they have a funny feeling in their head, they have strange sensations, know that goes on for say 30 seconds or a minute before it goes on until they're unaware and then maybe secondarily generalize a big convulsion. So you wanna stop that as soon as it starts, let's say. Or if somebody has a few jerks, they know that when they have a few shoulder jerks, that then over the next few minutes, it's gonna get bigger and culminate. So they wanna take something right away to stop it. That's more or less the same thing as stopping a prolonged seizure, except often people are awake and alert and interactive so they can participate in whatever you're going to give them. And that's an important distinction. So who should have rescue therapies? Well, not necessarily everyone, but all people with seizures should have a seizure action plan. Seizure action plans can be very simple or very elaborate. Uh, most schools, uh, all schools in Virginia, for instance, where I practice, require a formal seizure action plan. It's a document that's written out that says, here's a description of a seizure, here's a normal seizure, here's what to do normally, here's what to do for a prolonged seizure, here's exactly how much medicine to give and how much to give it. And for people who have uh, seizures frequently, it's important to have a seizure action plan just like that, whether they're in school or at home or anywhere else, because you, don't, you want to know that uh, in those cases when there is something that's prolonged or different, that there's an action. But there is another end of the spectrum. So imagine people who've uh, only had one or two seizures, they've just been diagnosed with epilepsy, uh, or someone who has infrequent seizures once every few months or six months or once a year. Those people don't necessarily need the same kind of seizure action plan, but they need an action plan sort of in concept. So they need to know that in an unusual situation of a prolonged seizure, or even the occurrence of one seizure, for instance, if you have newly diagnosed epilepsy, what to do. And what to do is probably not give them one of these rescue therapies because they probably don't need it because the seizure is probably going to stop on its own. So in that case, the seizure action plan is simply to tell the people around you that if you have a seizure, you need to call the rescue squad because you need to go to the ER to find out why you had the seizure and what needs to happen next. So everyone with epilepsy needs a seizure action plan. Anyone who's at risk of any of these kind of things I've talked about, their seizure action plan needs to include a rescue therapy. As I mentioned, historically, the rescue therapy was called the rescue squad. So another aspect of living in Virginia, it's very rural. I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia, where the entire population is about 100,000 people in the entire county. So on average, my patients travel a couple of hours to get to, to see me. And I have a clinic five hours away, as a matter of fact. So we have p people who live in very rural areas. And if you live in a rural area, it might take the rescue squad quite a while to get there. 
So not only for medical reasons, but also for peace of mind in those situations, I personally very frequently prescribe rescue medications to almost everybody who's at any risk of these things. If we look at the big picture, about 18% of people with epilepsy, so about a fifth of people with epilepsy will have a prolonged seizure at some time, long enough to be called status epilepticus. And so overall, about a fifth of people with epilepsy will have this, and that means about a fifth of people with epilepsy, at least, should have a rescue medication plan. So discuss it with your doctor and make a plan is the key. If we uh, consider the, the aspects of rescue medications that we would uh, use in selecting a rescue medication, we first have to, on this recurrent theme, is it to stop a seizure or is it to prevent the next one? Are they likely to have a level of alertness is very high so they can participate and swallow or are they unable to do that in the situation you're looking at? And that means looking at the duration of the person's typical seizure. If you typically have seizures that last just a minute or less, then there's no rescue therapy that's gonna kick in and work in one minute to prevent a seizure, to stop that seizure, excuse me. But if you have them in clusters over the course of a few minutes, then you'd have a medication you can take and swallow, let's say to prevent the next one. Probably unlikely it's gonna be a swallow medication. You can participate in taking the medicine by whatever form to prevent the next one. On the other hand, if the typical seizure is five minutes, and occasionally there are 20 minutes, then you need to uh, have something you can give that uh, is gonna act quickly and in which the person can't participate, whether it's rectal or nasal or intramuscular. So let's think about the ideal rescue medication, because that's really the, what we're after is an ideal rescue medication. The ideal one is non-oral, meaning you don't have to take it, uh, so you don't have to participate in getting it. It's quick acting, so it'll work almost immediately. It's simple. That means you can carry it with you. It doesn't require lots of mechanisms to put together or anything like that. It can withstand heat and cold and keep it in your car or your pocket. But it's not sedating. So if you give it to someone, they wake up from the seizure, they're right back to themselves. That would be ideal. And it can be used frequently because one problem with benzodiazepines is that they sometimes wear off. Because if these are such great medicines at stopping and preventing seizures, why not just take them every day? That's a perfectly logical question. Unfortunately, the answer is for most of these, if you took it every day to prevent the seizures, the effects tend to wear off. And if you're taking it every day and those effects wear off, and then you do have a seizure emergency, sometimes it's difficult to find a medicine like this to stop the seizure. So we don't tend to like to use medicines like this, that is benzodiazepines, for the ongoing treatment of seizures. We'd rather reserve them or save them for, for uh, abortive therapy or rescue medications. Of course, there are some people that do need to take them every day in specific situations and your epilepsy doctor, the epileptologist you see uh, in that situation will uh, work through that. So let's talk about the details of these delivery methods. I've referred to lots of different things and now let's get down to the nitty gritty. So let's talk about the difference between oral medications and rectal medications. So oral meaning taking by mouth, happy to be pills or liquid. They're easy to administer, they're easy to store, they're easy to obtain. Pharmacy has a bottle of it on the shelf typically if they're pills. But you must be uh, alert enough and able to swallow. And the problem is it takes time to swallow it, so even that amount of time. But then once you swallow it in your stomach, it has to break down, it simply has to, the medicine has to come out of the pill one way or another. It has to be absorbed into your stomach and then into your blood, and then it has to get up to your brain. So it has to get in your blood all the way up to your brain. Now, if you're not in a hurry, none of those matter. So, per, so under normal circumstances, when you're just taking a regular seizure medicine to keep away seizures, it doesn't matter if it's absorbed and all that stuff happens over minutes or hours because you're just gonna take the medicine one after the other, right? Say twice a day, for instance, or even once a day, it's gonna stay in your blood. But in a seizure emergency, that matters because as we said, we're trying to stop the seizures quickly. Rectal medication has a definite faster onset of action than oral medication because as soon as it goes into the rectum, it's absorbed through the lining of the rectum. It's relatively simple. That is, you can direct people to simply put this in their bottom. There's a low likelihood of complications. So one thing about being absorbed relatively slowly, so faster than the stomach, but slower than other methods, is that the peak drug levels don't peak as high. So we'll talk about that in a moment with a specific illustration, uh, but with when the level's not as high, you're less likely to get complications from it. It also makes it less sedating in some ways. 
but the problem is slow to administer. And the reason it's slow is because you got to get all the apparatus out, got to take the person's pants down and so forth. It's absorbed relatively slowly compared to say intranasal or intramuscular, certainly IV. It's uncomfortable if you're awake, you don't want to participate obviously. And it's socially unacceptable. And what I mean by unacceptable is that most people would not volunteer to do it in public. So those are important things to consider. Uh, now let's talk about intramuscular and intranasal administration. So intramuscular injections, that's a shot through a syringe with a needle on it into the muscle, let's say, into the, the, the shoulder's not a typical place, but into the leg, for instance. It has a fast onset of action, or relatively fast. The problem is it's difficult to keep syringes and needles available. That's inherently complicated in our society. Storage can be complicated, so it doesn't necessarily have a long half-life. And people have a lot of fear of needles. And what I mean by that is people don't want to get injected with a needle, so they have a certain fear of that because it's uncomfortable. And then people don't want to inject someone else the needle and they fear that they're going to cause a complication, which is possible. It's uh, surprisingly unlikely, but it's possible to cause that problem. So that's an appropriate fear, I guess you'd say. With intranasal administration of medication, just like say an afranasal spray, spray it gets blown up your nose, it has a fast onset of action and for the reasons we talked about, that medicine gets distributed up in the nasal passages, absorbed very quickly, it goes right into the blood. And you administer it yourself, so you're not reliant on anyone else. So if you're awake and alert and able to participate, shh, you can squirt it up your nose yourself. It's portable, simply carried in your pocket, for instance. It's discreet, so that people can't necessarily see what you're doing compared to, to rectal, for instance. And it's socially acceptable. So everyone knows about putting medicines up your nose, like nose like Afrin. The problem is it requires normal nasal passages, which isn't usually a problem, but can be. So at the very least, someone has to make sure you have normal nasal passages. It can be irritating. So some of these things have taken surprisingly long to be developed because you might be saying to yourself right now, why didn't we do this 20 years ago? As soon as we thought of this, why didn't we do it? And the reason is because it's more complicated than you think. It's more technology driven to develop intranasal medications. And so that technology is relatively new. And the reason is because you, you need a small volume, as we mentioned, and so you have to be able to concentrate the medication more than normal. You have to have a mechanism that reliably squirts it up the nose. And you have to do it in a form, uh, a formulation, so the chemical itself, the compound you squirt up the nose, has to not be irritating. So for example, there have been two, I guess, two developments of intranasal administration of medications that uh, were delayed a long time because it caused this irritation of the nasal passages. And so it took a while to overcome that. So it can be irritating. Uh, and if you're not using these sort of formulations I talked about, if you're using a traditional IV formulation, let's say, which is a pretty big volume to squirt up the nose, then you're not really sure if it was delivered because it might just get squirted down the nose and be swallowed. And now we're back to the swallowing problem that takes a long time to be absorbed. So let's be explicit about which rescue medications are approved for use. So these are approved for use, but not necessarily approved for abortion or, or, or rescue therapies of seizures. Diazepam uh, is approved for treatment of seizures, including Valium, the oral form, but it's the, it, until recently, was the only FDA approved medicine to uh, abort clusters in the form of diastat, which is a rectal gel form of diazepam. Lorazepam or Ativan is commonly used to stop seizures, but it's not really approved exactly for that use. It was developed a long time ago before anyone ever even thought of calling that something separate from treating a seizure. The same is true of clonazepam or clonopin. It's not so often used as an abortive therapy to stop an ongoing seizure, but it's often used to prevent the next seizure in a cluster where it's long enough between the seizures that you can swallow a pill, for instance, but it's not exactly approved for that use although uh, it's used in that way. Midazolam in the form of IV Versed is not approved for treatment of uh, abortive therapy or the regular treatment of seizures. But in the intranasal form was just recently approved as uh, Nasolam. So Nasolam was approved at the end of last year, but is still not available in pharmacies. This, this is intranasal midazolam. Uh, and I think it'll be available in maybe by the end of the year, the early part of next year, I suspect. Let's talk in detail now about diazepam. Uh, in the pill form, which is co the commonly known as a brand name Valium, but it's available as generic. 
In adults, it's typically given in 10 to 15 milligrams. Uh, and the advantage is that it's familiar. Uh, 15 milligrams in an adult will definitely knock them out. So if you take 15 milligrams pill, uh, for most adults, it will knock them out. Now for people with epilepsy who are taking other seizure medicines, particularly if you're already taking benzodiazepine medications of some kind, it may have less effect. And this is where I hesitate to say 10 to 15 milligrams is typical in adults because everyone is different. So talk to your doctor about that. It could be as low as five milligrams. It potentially could be more than 15 milligrams. Rectal diastat, uh, the rectal diazepam we've been talking about, uh, allows for a quick drug absorption, as we said, through the rectal mucosa. One important thing is that the dose has to be dialed on the syringe. So if you look at the illustration over here, illustration three, this is from the package insert. So this is from the, from, uh, the actual instructions you'll get with the diazepam. And you can see it has a dial on it and the dial uh, has to determine how much is given. So be sure to ask the pharmacy to dial up the right dose. Uh, the advantage to this is that it's effective, it's inexpensive and generally covered by insurance. I guess inexpensive is a relative term, but it is relatively inexpensive. Uh, it's not FDA approved for stopping a seizure, although people commonly think of that. That's not really what it's approved for. Uh, but patients, and also not surprisingly, patients find delivery invasive. Uh, and there are not very many adults that would volunteer to have a rectal medicine administered at the mall, let's say, you know, out in public. So this has really limited the use despite it being relatively effective. And you can see in this cartoon over here, on the right side of the screen, what's uh, actually involved. So you have to take someone's, you have to prepare the syringe, so that's one step. So first you have to have the syringe with you, then prepare the syringe, then take the person's pants down, uh, make sure there's nothing obstructing uh, their anus, and then deliver the medicine in their rectum, and then hold their cheeks together so it doesn't come out. And that's sometimes more complicated than you think, uh, because it has to actually be absorbed, you know, make sure it's absorbed, you have to hold their, their cheeks together. So on the one hand, this, when this was developed and approved, it was uh, kind of a godsend for some people because it would prevent the next seizure in a cluster. As it was used to prevent the next seizure in a cluster, it also was commonly used while someone's still seizing because it's possible to do that complicated and it's not exactly approved for that use. So on the one hand, it's, a great, it's great, particularly in people who can't participate while you're at home. On the other hand, it's kind of obviously uh, a little bit invasive. So let's talk about the difference between IV and rectal dosing of diazepam, because this is really what we think about as physicians or in developing new drugs about how this works. Because remember, it's all about the time for the onset of action, how quickly it can work. And at the other end, how long it lasts, how long does it continue to keep away the seizures? So here in this graph, you can see that the circles is an IV dose. So well, first of all, let me explain the graph. So over here is the blood concentration. So up here is more and more concentrated in the blood, the level in the blood. And over here is time, and these are hours. So if you look at the circles, as soon as you inject an IV medication, it goes way, way up, because it gets all concentrated in your blood. It goes right from the syringe into your vein. It's a whole bunch in your veins. Then it gradually comes down as it's distributed throughout your body and gradually comes out of your body. The triangles here is the rectal administration. So you can see that it takes a little longer to kick in, but it still kicks in pretty quickly. Now the peak of this doesn't happen for about an hour, but you can see that it achieves pretty high levels. So I can tell you as these levels go, it's a pretty high level after just a few minutes. So my interpretation of this is that it takes about 15 minutes for the diastat to reach a typical level, but it's progressively going up and up in the blood throughout that 15 minutes. So for some people, it'll achieve a good level to stop seizures in less than that. So that's how we think about its onset of action. So ideally you want to have an onset of action at the peak level very quickly. Then you want to last a long time, and that's this graph out here. So you can see the levels are still last a long time and last a little longer with the rectal form, the triangles, than with the IV form even. This usually is less, less of an issue because it lasts a relatively long time. So how effective is it? When randomized double-blind placebo-controlled studies, so randomized means patients are randomly assigned to one treatment or the other. Double-blind means the physician doesn't know whether they're giving the drug or giving placebo. So that means just water in this case was compared against. And it's placebo controlled, meaning half the people get, or a portion of the people get uh, the drug and another portion get uh, water essentially. And what's called study one 
we can look at the percent that were seizure free for 24 hours. That was the main outcome and kind of an easy thing to understand. And so if you think about preventing the next seizure, which is what this was about, 62% of people who got diastat didn't have a seizure in the next 24 hours. Whereas if you got water, only 20% were seizure free for 24 hours. That's a pretty big difference. Now there's a couple of things to note. Not everybody does it prevent the seizure, in this case 62%. So that means about 38% still had a seizure the next 24 hours. But if you got water instead, so if you didn't get diastat, then 80% had a seizure in the next 24 hours. And these were people who were known to have clusters of seizures. That's why they were in the study. In study two, it was somewhat similar, a little narrower difference. But if you look at seizure-free for 12 hours, 55% who got the drug were seizure-free compared to 34% who got placebo or water. So it's a little narrower difference. And this has to do with how the studies were conducted, but also over what uh, period of time. So the idea is that's pretty effective. If you look just here at, at study one, and that's why this is really what launched the notion that rescue therapies were effective and safe. So lorazepam is only available in the pill form for outpatient use. It's familiar. Doctors kind of use it as their favorite form in the pill form. It has a longer uh, onset of action, so it takes longer to kick in than, say, diazepam and diastat. But we think it may last longer. There's not a lot of evidence for that, but that's kind of the notion. It's not designed to go under the tongue, as we said, but some people use it that way anyway. But mostly when you do that, it's probably mostly swallowed. It's kind of a favorite in preventing the next seizure when it's likely to occur relatively soon. And if you can give it IV. So doctors really prefer, historically have preferred lorazepam. Maybe that's changing, but that was true. Uh, and that was true as an inpatient in the IV form, but also it's probably true for giving people pills in the clinic. Clonazepam is only available in pill form in the United States. It's also familiar and has a long onset of action, but may last a long time, which is why we'd like to give it rather than other things if you have to give a benzodiazepine every day to prevent seizures. That's kind of a favorite in that way that many doctors would rather give clonazepam if you have to take it regularly every day to keep away a seizure. But it takes a long time to kick in, so the next, if the next seizure is going to happen in a few minutes, that's not really going to help. Midazolam is really the, the focus of our discussion, I think. It's not available as a pill. Uh, it's great for short-term treatment of seizure clusters or acute repetitive seizures. So this is something that has the potential to both stop the ongoing seizure and prevent the next seizure, and maybe even to uh, prevent a seizure from progressing. The intranasal form is approved as the drug nasal, uh, nasalam, pretty clever name, uh, in May of 2019, but as I mentioned, won't be, it's not available in pharmacies yet. Uh, it allows for quick drug absorption because as the drug gets dispersed up the nose, it's then absorbed quickly. It's indicated for uh, people 12 years old and older for acute treatment of seizures. Its uh, advantage is it has rapid onset of action, it's simple to use, and it's portable. So here's the mechanism over here. It's a very slick little mechanism. It has this uh, plunger down here, something to hold on to, and this thing that goes up the nose. And all you do is de depress it. When you do, you can only depress it fully. It can't be depressed part way. So as soon as you start to depress it, boom, it'll depress all the way and deliver the whole dose. And it's administered just like in this picture, which is pretty simple. There is a little bit of irritation with it uh, sometimes. The incidence of this is relatively low, actually. And uh, the uncertainty of delivery is only if you don't have an open nasal passage. So you don't have to breathe, you don't have to do anything because of the way that it's atomized in a very small volume, it goes up the nose. So if, you're no, if your nasal passages are normal, uh, there's not much uncertainty of delivery. So how effective is it? Well, in the pivotal study, 80% of patients who got the drug had their seizure terminated in 10 minutes. Now in those who got placebos, so they just got water up their nose or saline actually. 70% uh, were stopped within 10 minutes. And so you'd say, well, that's not a big difference. But remember, these are studies of people who are having ongoing seizures. So you don't know if their seizure is naturally going to stop soon or if you're going to stop it soon with the drug. So you'd expect that most of these pe people would have a seizure that did stop within 10 minutes. But what you're doing is trying to treat those people in whom it might go on longer. Uh, and if you look at the preventive part of it, so for the next six hours, 58% of those who got drug had the, didn't have a seizure within six hours compared to 37% of those who got saline or placebo. So this is pretty effective. You know, it's not 100%. We'd really want something that stops things 100% of the time, and this didn't do that in these studies. Now, if you look at over the course of 24 hours, there's really no difference about whether you got 
a dose of midazolam or you got placebo. And that's not surprising because midazolam has a short half-life. You just administer one dose, we expect it to work for the next few hours. We don't typically expect to work for 24 hours. So that means the strategy here for all of these drugs is to give the abortive therapy, then to do something to prevent the seizure in the long term. What, what are they gonna do? What do you do to stop the seizure tomorrow? Because if you had a long one today, you might have a long one tomorrow. If you had a cluster today, you might have a cluster tomorrow. So with each one of these, you should be thinking about what are you going to do? Sometimes it's not do anything, but sometimes it's make a change in the other medicines, the other seizure medicines you're taking to prevent the next seizure. It can cause sleepiness, which about happens about twice as often if you take midazolam than placebo. That's not, it doesn't happen frequently though. It can have some nasal discomfort, uh, but it, with a single dose in clinical trials, there's no difference for a single dose, whether you got saline or you got the drug. So for a single dose up one nostril in the clinical trial, there was no irritability. It wasn't increased above baseline. But if you got two doses, one up one nostril and up the other nostril, then in that case, those people had uh, an increased incidence of nasal irritability. As I mentioned, physicians are really concerned that midazolam and drugs like that will alter breathing, will slow people's breathing or stop it. But there is no incidence of that uh, in the clinical trial. And for the kind of doses we're giving here uh, is not really a problem. So, uh, whoops, let me go back here for just a moment and mention, so how is this used? So if we think again about the device here, each one of these devices contains five milligrams of midazolam. And the idea is that at the onset of a seizure uh, or the onset of a cluster to deliver it up one nose. And if that works, great. If it doesn't work, then 10 minutes later, an adult could deliver a second dose of this up the other nostril. Uh, and typically we'd suggest if you need more than that, my view is if you need more than that, you need to go to the emergency room. Something else is going on or call the rescue squad if it's that, uh, that urgent. Uh, and it can't be given every day. So what? So often, how often can you give it? The instructions are in common clinical practice would be no more than a couple of times a week. So typically uh, we'd say no more than twice a week. And if you got up to twice a week, we'd say you need to do something else to prevent the seizures uh, from starting to begin with. And so now let's talk about the other things in development, what are under review by the FDA or in development. There's intranasal diazepam, which will be called Valtoco. And uh, that's already had an NDA or new drug application filed with the FDA. That means they've completed enough of the studies that the sponsor thinks the FDA should approve it. And so they've sent that off to the FDA. Whether that will be successful or not will depend on what the FDA says and so forth. There's buccal diazepam film. What buccal means is inside the lip onto the gums. Uh, you can kind of think of it like under the tongue, but instead of under the tongue, it can just be on the side of the mouse, mouth. And that'll be called... Uh, Libervant, I believe. And then there's also inhaled alprazolam, which will be called staccato. The intranasal diazepam uh, has published preliminary results of open label pharmacokinetic and long-term safety studies. And what that means is that because uh, diazepam in the rectal form is already approved for use to treat seizure clusters, it, the main purpose of or strategy in developing this to see that the intranasal form is absorbed and has the same blood levels as the rectal form. So those studies have been completed. Uh, there are longer term safety studies. So that means giving the drug to more and more people to see it's going to be safe. and There's no unanticipated or unexpected problems. And those are ongoing or finalizing. Buccal diazepam is illustrated in this picture here from uh, the company's website. You can see this little film here uh, there are some breath mint films that are kind of similar. And so you can imagine you can put it under the tongue, you can put it on the gum here or uh, in the cheek. Open label pharmacokinetic studies have been completed. That means that studies were done to see that if you use this for diazepam, it's absorbed similar to the rectal form because that's really the gold standard here. There's a single dose crossover with rectal gel that has preliminary results. And that means half the patients got the rectal gel and half the patients got the buccal diazepam film. And it looks like in the preliminary results that it has the same absorption and levels as the rectal gel, which is what you're really after to see that they're equivalent. So the preliminary results look like that, but really we're awaiting the final analysis of the onset of action. So how long it took in the comparison to rectal diazepam, did it work the same, did it act the same, did it 
stop seizures uh, or prevent, stop the cluster to the same degree that rectal diazepam or diastat did. So that's awaiting uh, final review. Then inhaled alprazolam. Inhaled alprazolam uh, should have very fast onset of action because when you inhale a drug and it goes into your lungs, it has immediate access to the blood. The problem with alprazolam, it doesn't have a very long half-life, so it doesn't stay in the blood very long. Preliminary studies have been done. So there's a proof of principle study, meaning a study in which it's not designed to find a statistical advantage, but just a study done to see that it seems like it probably ought to work. And so five patients were given the uh, inhaled alprazolam, and it seems to eliminate or reduce the EEG discharges in those with photosensitive seizures. And what I mean by that is there are some people with epilepsy in whom when you flash lights in their eyes, it causes a discharge on the EEG. And the inhaled alprazolam suppresses that discharge on the EEG so they don't have them anymore. And we think that's gonna be a good surrogate marker that is a substitute marker for controlling seizures. There's an ongoing effectiveness study that's a double-blind placebo-controlled study. So some get the drug, some get placebo. And the idea is to see did it stop the seizure within two minutes. So this is a little different than the other studies we've talked about. The other studies we've talked about were designed mostly at preventing the next seizure. So these are designed at stopping the current seizure within two minutes or preventing the next seizure. So that's a, a little different. Obviously, you have to be able to participate to inhale uh, the device that's illustrated up here. So we really reviewed uh, a lot of things, maybe kind of a whirlwind review, I'm afraid, of rescue medications. And the take home messages here are that everyone should have a seizure action plan. I hope that's implicit in what I've said. That if there's any risk of a prolonged seizure or seizure clusters of any kind, you should talk with your doctor about whether or not a rescue medication is useful. The current rescue medications we have are a little bit cumbersome one way or another, but, as soon, but uh, we think inhaled or intranasal drugs, particularly the intranasal midazolam that was just approved will be a lot less cumbersome and, and easier to use. And when they are, then hopefully this will have uh, wider use. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Fountain. That was a terrific uh, review of the available and upcoming rescue medications or abortive therapies. I know we've got a little bit of time left for some questions, and I know questions have come in from our audience. Uh, so again, if you do have additional questions, please submit them into the Q&A tab uh, located at the bottom of your Zoom panel and click send, and Brandon will start reading them aloud. Uh, I do think that if we, if we run out of time to address the questions, we'll, we'll try to get answers back to you via email. So, Brandon. Absolutely. I'll, I'll try to uh, rapid fire off some questions here. Um, however, uh, actually many of the questions did get answered already, so that's great. Um, one question that came in, uh, Dr. Fountain, was, is there any reason not to use diastat before a seizure in a child who has, you know, been seizing for five minutes? And if so, how long should you wait? You know, there are six, there's exceptions to every single rule. But as a general principle, if someone in it, it, if you've been prescribed rectal diazepam gel to stop seizures, uh, and you have a, let's say a child with seizing, who's been seizing for five minutes, there'd be a few situations where you wouldn't give them the rectal diazepam gel. The times when you would think about that, so there, there's, a, there's a safety concern, and there's a treatment concern. So the safety concern is if they've already gotten lots of other medications, let's say, let's imagine that You've already given them other benzodiazepines, let's say clonazepam or lorazepam, or even diazepam in a pill form an hour ago, and so it's already in their blood. You might be hesitant to give them more without any kind of supervision. Or the second situation is if it's someone who's tenuous that might, be, might have a, a medical reason not to. But as a general principle, we give rescue medications and tell them, that, you know, if you actually time a seizure, five minutes is a really long time. We do this in the epilepsy monitoring unit. We admit people to the hospital, observe their seizures to figure out where they're from and so forth. So a common uh, exercise is to ask people when we watch the seizure on the video go by, say, how long was that? And they almost always say, oh, that was five minutes. But you know what? It's almost always under 90 seconds, a minute and a half. So while you're watching someone seize five minutes, is kind of forever, especially the big convulsive seizure. So for convulsive seizures or uh, medically serious seizures, you might say, usually we'd we'd advise giving the medicine after five minutes of seizure activity. Now, if it's a non-convulsive seizure, 
or if you're not sure it's a seizure, that's a different situation. So I suppose we could imagine a situation where you wouldn't give the medicine within five minutes because you're because it's a non-convulsive seizure and that you think it's not causing any harm. Let's say it's just a staring seizure, an absent seizure. It'd be unusual to have one for more than five minutes, but there are specific situations when you might. Uh, or if you're not sure that it's a seizure. So if you haven't figured that out yet, then it's you know, maybe it would be okay to uh, not give the medicine if it's something other than convulsive activity. Great, thank you. Um, another popular question that came through uh, is, are there any reasons to administer rescue medications to individuals that may have one seizure without a cluster, you know, that being a tonic-clonic or, or a grand mal seizure? That goes back to really defining what it means to have a cluster. So as a casual observation, we can easily make the statement, sure, give the medicine to prevent the next seizure. But if you think about this in detail, as the FDA does when they think about exactly what the medicine is used for, this starts with a careful history to determine what is a typical seizure for that individual. So if that individual has big convulsive grand mal generalized tonic clonic seizures that typically last uh, three minutes, uh, but they have them, let's say they have them uh, three times in one day, or even twice in one day, and you want to prevent the next seizure, uh, usually you'd let that seizure complete itself because it would almost take three minutes just to administer whatever you're going to administer. Uh, and if you admit it, so typically we'd let that seizure complete itself, then give whatever medicine is appropriate to prevent the next seizure. So there are lots of situations in general. Uh, I'm glad that question was asked because in general, we wouldn't treat an acute seizure unless it lasted more longer than usual or more than five minutes. Now, as I said, five minutes is a long time. So by three minutes, everybody's getting all excited and getting ready to do something, either call the rescue squad or give an abortive therapy or do something because it'll kind of take you five minutes to figure all that out. But for most people with epilepsy, they don't have a seizure that lasts longer than three minutes. And in fact, if you measure it, it's usually less than 90 seconds, a minute and a half. Now, afterwards, they may be zonked seemingly dead to the world for a long time, even half an hour sometimes. But the actual seizure part of it is typically less than three minutes and almost always less than five minutes. So if you define the typical seizures less than five minutes, we typically wouldn't recommend the currently available abortive therapies. Maybe that'll change. You know, maybe, maybe if it turns out intranasal medications really work very quickly and are very effective, then maybe we'll get it for ongoing seizures. But at the moment, we would say no. Great, thank you. Um, we do have time for one more quick question, and then, uh, like Laura said, we will try to do our best to to get to those questions that have uh, have been have been coming in recently. Um, is do you have any suggestions for rescue therapies uh, in children younger than two? Obviously, because the FDA approved cutoff uh, for diastat is two years old. Yeah, that's a situation where you really need to talk to your doctor about that. There are other alternatives. Everyone gets nervous in treating young children. I treat mostly adults, but because of the way uh, the situation I trained, I see both children and adults. Uh, and when they're less than two, it gets a little complicated because the dosing changes as well as the method of administration. So I'd say talk to your doctor about that. For prolonged seizures in those less than two, we have the same concerns that we have in those older than two. So although uh, the medications are only approved down to a certain age. In a particular situation, doctors can use them in those situations. So for example, the IV form of midazolam is definitely not approved to be blown up the nose until now. It's still the IV form is not, but yet we would use that in certain situations when we knew the details warranted it. So being less than two, you could still use rectal diastat, for instance, or, or could use some other form so talk to your doctor about that and what might be best in that particular situation. Great. Well, thank you again, Dr. Fountain. I'm going to turn it back over to Laura now. Great. Yes, I want to thank you as well, Dr. Fountain. That was, a, again, a terrific overview. Uh, this is an area where we need a lot of education to help understand the different options that are becoming available for us So, I, as a community. So I really want to thank you again for sharing your expertise in this. Uh, I also want to thank <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I also want to thank the Band Foundation for sponsoring this webinar as well as the, all of our webinars this year. Uh, and I'd like to thank our audience for your, your time and attention, uh, your interest in learning about this topic, and for your excellent questions. Uh, if you have additional questions about this topic or wish to learn about any of other um, CURE's research programs, 
please visit our website at www.cureepilepsy.org. Uh, I also want to mention that this webinar, as well as all of our past webinars and our future webinars, um, are recorded and available on our website. And you can find them in the program section of the CURE website. So with that, I want to thank you and I hope you all enjoy your day.